Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We are so glad to have you with us here today. We gather today to worship the one who created us, the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. With joyful hearts, let us worship God. Let us pray. Mighty God, everything you do reveals your glory and majesty. Open our eyes to see what you are doing in our lives. Let us marvel at your good gifts and your wise provisions. Your acts are amazing, Lord. We cannot comprehend the number of blessings you give us from day to day. As we gather today around your name, we pray that you would fill our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Transform us, Lord, and make us more like you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us continue in prayer as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's first hymn is hymn number 717, I am the God that healeth thee. Please stand if you're able.
We thank you for all the blessings in our lives. We give to you these gifts with joy and thanksgiving, knowing they will be used to help others and to further your kingdom. Bless all those who give to support our church and your kingdom, physically, financially, and in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all, also to all who have longed for his appearing. Thus ends this morning's reading. Our next hymn is hymn number 497. We will be singing verses 1, 3, and 4. I will praise him. Before God, 
For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. May God add blessing to this reading of his word. I just wanted to uh, reflect with you uh, as, as we uh, think about this. Here was this uh, story that Jesus told to demonstrate what people think about themselves, and what they think about God, and what they think about heaven. And uh, someone had collected some, some uh, letters from children to see what they thought about the same kind of topics. And here are some of these, these letters from children. Here's Pete, age nine, who said, Please say in your sermon, Peter Peterson has been good, a good boy all week. I am Peter Peterson. <laughs> Carl, age 10. Are there any devils on earth? I think there may be one in my class. <laughs> Arnold, age 8. I know God loves everybody, but he never met my sister. <laughs> Stephen, age uh, 8. I would like to go to heaven someday because I know my brother won't be there. <laughs> Lorene, age nine. I think there were more people would come to your church if you moved it to Disneyland. <laughs> Alexander, age ten. Please say a prayer for our little league team. We need God's help for a new pitcher. <laughs> Joshua, age ten. My father says I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't want to because we already have enough rules in my house. <laughs> Marie, age nine. How does God know the good people from the bad? Do you tell him or does he read about it in the newspapers? <laughs> Ralph, age 11. I like your sermon on Sunday, especially when it is finished. <laughs> And Alan, age nine, I hope to go to heaven someday, but later rather than sooner. That's right. So, so the children have ideas, and you know it's interesting that Jesus said that we should be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven, and so there is something in their thoughts and prayers that we ought to be a little bit more like them rather than uh, just. It's, it's amazing to be amused by them, but we need to be a little bit more like them in our heart. And so when we look at this uh, parable here of the Pharisee and the tax collector, we see that there, sometimes when we grow into things, we have these heart problems that are, are difficult. And uh, there was one pastor that uh, was reflecting on how difficult it was for him when he thought, okay, how do I share my faith with somebody who's far from faith? And he had somebody in his uh, uh, workplace before he became a pastor, and he was early on. He's raised by a pastor, and, and so a PK, and then he's working in this workplace, and somebody was coming in to work drunk frequently, and he's like, how do I share something with this guy? And in one conversation, the man said he was an atheist, and, uh, and so he wasn't really interested in hearing much about God. And this, this pastor, uh, before training and all, he's like, well, you know, I read some things that are maybe surprising to you, that good people go to hell and bad people go to heaven. And, and the man said, well, I want to hear more about that story because I've never heard that message before. And he said, well, Jesus came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And then he went into this uh, story of the Pharisee and the tax collector and how sometimes people get caught up in themselves and others have an open door to heaven. And it's heaven's surprise. And so with that, this man uh, had, had been more open to hearing about who God was, because all he had before was the stereotypes. 
sometimes those stereotypes come from us, you know. And, and so we have to be careful what image we are portraying. You know, the, the thing here is that Jesus was, if you say, why did he tell this story? He told it to some who were confident of their own righteousness. And, and yet we know from Scripture, when we go to, the, to the God's throne, we have confidence to go before God's throne, but it's not based on our own righteousness. And to add to that, they look down on others. That's, that becomes a problem. And, and so it's, it's easy for us to read through, and uh, as, as we read the New Testament, we see many flaws of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, and it's easy to uh, just dismiss them. And it's not so much that this Pharisee had bad habits, but he had a bad heart. His habits were good, that, that he was doing many of the right things, but uh, it really comes down to what was his heart before God. He thought he was justified by his habits, not by the grace of God. He thought he was justified and better than others because of his habits, and then here is, uh, here is this other one. Now, a tax collector... I was someone who was uh, working as a Jewish person, working for the Roman government. They collected taxes. They collected their own bonus on top of that. And, and they were extortionists. And they held people. And, and the Jews held them in contempt because they considered them criminals and outcasts, and they would not even let a tax collector give witness in court. Well, you know the guy's a liar. So why would they? They weren't even eligible to be a person who would give testimony. And the Pharisees, on the other hand, they were the people that you wanted to live in their neighborhood. This was somebody that was living uh, very well. They weren't going to uh, rob from you. They were going to uh, be the kind of people and community leaders he would say, hey, I'm, I'm in this neighborhood. I'm in the neighborhood of the Pharisees, not so bad. And they're generous and they're trying to uh, follow God's law. And it would be people with moral and clean living. And, and yet, see, it wasn't the practice and the habit that was the problem of the Pharisee. It was, again, the heart was the problem. And so Jesus says this thing again. He says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves would be exalted. And so he's telling us something here about salvation, about a just position before God, justification, and what true humility means, that God delights in the humble heart. God delights in one who wants him and says, I need you, God. I want you in my life, not just someone who's full of hot air and puffed up in their ego. And so we see the Pharisees' boastful prayer, and it just goes through about uh, the very things that he did. That, uh, you know, it wasn't so bad that he's saying, you know, I've, I've got some habits here. There's, there's almost like a, a danger that comes on, and, uh, and I knew knew somebody that they were talking about their testimony and they were in ministry and the more that they developed in, into ministry they realized hey I'm I had some for example uh, some friends in college who were very disciplined in in their studies they I was in a Penn State fraternity house and I had three fraternity brothers in the room that I was in that were very disciplined in studying the Bible, in, uh, in pray and devotions, and uh, one was a pastor's son, one was, uh, his dad was uh, kind of in ministry, in a sort of, he was a lay leader in his church, and, and another one went off to go to the mission field after, after college. This is not a fraternity house, it's kind of ironic, it's not the stereotype that you think of fraternity house uh, brothers, right? 
But but yet sometimes when people would get into spiritual disciplines, they would try to wear it as some badge. That was not the case of these three guys, and I found them to be very humble and and moving in my life, an example uh, for me rather than the problem people that had the heart problem. And and years after I got out of seminary, one of the guys said uh, about another fraternity brother living in another room, and you know there were some interesting guys living there as well as <laughs> as these individuals, and I uh, and yet. He said, uh, you know, Bill became a Christian. And I was like, I said, how did that happen? Because it was just kind of uh, beyond my understanding of who Bill was and what he was all about. And humbly, my roommate said, well, you know, I had been working with him a little bit. And I thought... Here was someone, he was probably the most disciplined individual that I had known. Financially disciplined in other, every other way. And yet, it didn't affect his heart. It didn't affect his heart. He still had a heart to see others, to see the value in them, and to say, I want you to be in the grace of God. And, and to me, that was uh, one of the things that, that I lifted out because uh, so often, we can get proud of the things, you know, I've, I've heard many stories, uh, had some family members who went through uh, Weight Watchers and that kind of thing, and, uh, and they would talk about someone who lost weight that was more ungracious than uh, the general public. And it's like, what is wrong with these people? Uh, sometimes whatever habits or success we might get in life can interfere with the way that we look at other people, and that, that to me is a very, very bad thing. Uh, and I think that's what Jesus was saying here, is that it wasn't so bad what happened, uh, that this, the commitments of the Pharisee, but the heart issue was really not good, the, the self-righteousness. Now, you know, we can also have people who say the, the common phrase is like hypocrites in the church. It's like, well, just because someone's living in such a way doesn't mean that they're a hypocrite. And so we have to be careful that uh, those who are practicing spiritual disciplines aren't nailed as a hypocrite because they're in church. Doesn't mean that they think that they're better than others. This particular individual had that problem, and Jesus said this was to those who were self-righteous, thinking it was on their own standing. The, the test to me is when we sing Amazing Grace, do we see ourselves in it? If, if we don't think that grace is amazing for us, we may be at risk for being this Pharisee that has habits and looks down on others. We have to see that grace is amazing, that God was loving us the same as he loves others. And so it's interesting that uh, as I work in the prison and we have uh, people who are generally not well received in society, even after they have served their time, do we see that if, if it were like this tax collector, maybe the the felon, maybe the, the sex offender, maybe someone else who had this label. Uh, even in the state, the name that they call inmates, uh, it used to be they would call them inmates, so they would, like, used to call them convicts. They keep changing all the names because you got to find something politically correct that's not supposed to be derogatory. And yet the, the politically correct term at this point, and I don't understand it, is they want to call them offenders. And so I was like, offenders? It's like, well, why are you holding on to that? And, and I, I personally prefer the term inmate because they're incarcerated and they're an inmate, and yet some feel that that's a derogatory term. And so they say, well, offenders. I said, well, do you think that 100% of the people that are in here are guilty of what they got locked up for? I personally don't. 
And, and so that's just a personal opinion. I believe that people get locked up for things. Some of them. God's justice is perfect in, in our world. We have due process. And through due process, people, decisions get made in court and by juries. And so I don't believe there's 100% uh, effectiveness in our court system. And so some people may be in for things that they did not do. And that's, that's just from a theological standpoint how I look at that. And, and yet, um, as I see inmates giving their lives over to Christ or in services and praying, sometimes much like this tax collector who's standing at a distance wondering, you know, can I, can I even get right before God? Can I approach God? Sometimes I see, uh, and, and as, for example, this tax collector, they said he, he wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. He beat his breast, which was an emotional response in that culture that a woman would only do. A man wouldn't do that, and certainly not in public. This was a man who was like, I am broken, and I am crying out for the mercy of God. And, and in the Greek, as, they, uh, as you look at that word for mercy, it, it connects to the mercy seat, the covering of my sins. I need my sins to be covered. And in the Old Testament, the, the sins were covered by the blood of sacrifices, when Christ came, the sins were cleansed and removed. And so, uh, as we see people who want to be right with God in standing and want their sins to be cleansed and removed from, from uh, keeping them at, from that barrier, only Christ can do that. And sometimes, honestly, I see some individuals who come forward at the altar and kneel on the floor and literally cry before God and have tears on the carpet because their heart is in sync with wanting in touch with the living God. And yet, we have in our culture, and I'm not thinking that we're here ourselves, but there are people that would maybe not even attend church and would think, how could that person possibly be right before God or might have some attitude to look down on the felon who is now in the kingdom of heaven, someone who had been convicted, someone who maybe had been guilty of these things, and yet how could that person make it to heaven? You know, that is a surprise of heaven because God's love, God's grace is amazing. And we have to make room for the possibility that other brothers and sisters who may not have lived life as we had will be standing with us in heaven. Some people will say there will be a lot of people surprised when they get to heaven. And usually they're talking about one denomination or another. It's like, well, it doesn't matter. Fortunately, there, there isn't any card that you can carry from the right denomination that's going to make it there. You know, it's all by the blood of Jesus applied in our lives. All because of what he has done and not something that we ourselves have done. And, and here again, this, this uh, Pharisee, this religious leader, uh, you could say a deacon or an elder or some upstanding member of society, treated others with contempt. And uh, there is... There are probably many ways that we could uh, could have pride rise up in us, uh, not just a satisfaction in our habits, but uh, a sense of that, that we've achieved somehow or another the status that we need. That was God's accomplishment. Let's, let's just recognize that. God was the one that achieved the status that we need before his Father. Jesus did that for us. And sometimes we have hard times admitting when we're wrong or confessing sin before others. Uh, might resent uh, serving or might uh, resent that we're the ones serving, like uh, Mary and Martha. 
Martha had good habits. There was nothing wrong with Martha's habits, but her heart had to be adjusted. Uh, the, a friend of mine, uh, when they were raising their kids, they said, you know, my kids need a double head, you know, like a battery, uh, an attitude adjustment. And uh, sometimes we find that if we come before God and, and we don't ask for our attitude, it's like it's a big thanks. It's like, I'm so thankful of everything I've done. But like, how can you stand before God and say you're so, so thankful for what you have done when he has done so much more for us than we could ever measure? And so when we come before him, sometimes we need the attitude adjustment to be truly grateful for what he has done, not just the situation we're in life right now, but the one who is the source, uh, the one who will help us. And, and so I... I see this uh, posture of both of them, one standing proudly and even looking around. Here's, here's an example of somebody who doesn't even know this man. He just knows his status, his title, his label. And, and yet we're not to look with labels. We're to look to the one who gives life. And, and labels often will be the things that identify when we are Prideful that we label somebody else to discredit them, to disenfranchise them from the grace of God. And so God is the one who wants all to come to repentance, all people to become his children. And, and so um, Martin Luther said that there are two sorts of people in the world. Sinners who think themselves righteous and the righteous ones who think themselves sinners. And by that, he meant that we, we can be saints and understand how we got to be a saint. We are the saint of God by the grace of Jesus. And so the next time that we sing through Amazing Grace or some of these songs, even like the, the song that we had sung, it gives recognition to how God placed us in position. And how easily we might fall. I was talking to uh, someone that, uh, honestly, uh, there was there was an inmate that was uh, looked up to for the incredible maturity that he has, and he prays, and uh, you know he has amazing ability to guide and encourage other inmates. And he said, and he could either be proud of that or humble. He said. People look up to me like, like I'm in a different class than them. And he said, I recognize that I have flesh just the same as everybody else. I can still act out in my spirit in ways that aren't honoring to God. And so that humble spirit was something that I think is really important for us to hold on to. And I think that's what Jesus was encouraging here that uh, we have to be careful with our habits and our heart. Now, when the heart gets right, some good habits will come, but that's when the pruning has to come, that God prune the stuff away in my heart that doesn't belong because it will grow like weeds. And so we need the giver of grace and mercy to help us in, in those times. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the reminders, uh, just from your word, that um, there are many ways that we can serve you, many ways that our hearts can be right with you and our habits. We want both the disciplines and uh, the positioning of our heart toward you. May we always be thankful to you. And uh, when our love is right with you and we are thankful, we will see others with a point of grace and mercy and call to reach out to them that our fellowship be right uh, with those within the body and our position and attitude toward others would also be right. Uh, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn to hymn number 690, He Leadeth Me. <laughs>
hearts. We need to lead our actions, our, our ministry. We, we know that uh, there isn't any good thing that we can do apart from you. Nothing that we do lasts forever except the things that we do for you in the kingdom. And we thank you, God, that you have called us into an eternal kingdom uh, that we might see that uh, whatever days that we're in, that there is a day coming of rejoicing when we're with you. There's a day of the party and the celebration when the bride and the groom gather in heaven. Uh, we want to be part of that and in preparation that uh, you will guide us and we will draw others and extend this invitation of your great love um, not uh, a spirit of judgment or contempt for others, but a spirit of, we found some, something amazing in you, and we want others to know you. And so we ask that our hearts might be right, that our ministry will follow uh, the, the very will and purpose that you have called us to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for our benediction, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.